This is an audio archive edition of WINA's Charlottesville Right Now with Coy Barefoot, brought to you by the Charlottesville Podcasting Network at sevillepodcast.com. Live in studio, I am truly delighted to welcome here at, uh, at the Studio A on Rose Hill Drive, Dan Jordan, the president of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, which owns and operates and oversees Monticello up here on the Little Mountain outside of Charlottesville. Thank you so much for coming by. I really appreciate it. Coy, it's great to be with you. Thank you. I've uh, been looking forward to this very much. And I, before we go any further, I just want to remind listeners that the phone lines are always open for you at 977-1070. If you've got a comment or a question or uh, just something to toss into the mix, we always Always look forward to hearing from you at any time. It's 977-1070. Dan, the best place to start is for the folks. We got a lot of new folks to Charlottesville, as we know when we get out on, on 29. Uh, there's a lot of folks who are new to town who may not know you. Can you give us sort of a Dan Jordan 101 and where you're from and how you found yourself waking up in the morning and finding yourself as president of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation? Well, thanks, Coy. I'm a native Mississippian and went to the University of Mississippi on a baseball and basketball scholarship. Uh, went in the United States Army Infantry, served in Korea and at Fort Bragg, and then ended up at the University of Virginia on a Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation fellowship. And now I'm very honored and pleased to be the president of the Thomas Jefferson uh, Foundation. I uh, was in the academy for a number of years and uh, came to Monticello full time on January the 1st, 1985, as the executive uh, director. And do you remember the first time that you visited Monticello? Do you have a, a first Monticello memory? I have a vivid memory of my first visit, uh, which was on a high school band trip to Washington. And I recall uh, being overwhelmed by the beauty uh, of the place. I don't have any specific recollections, but I will never forget that impression. Let's talk about uh, maybe the Foundation 101. Give us an idea of the scope of of this organization that you uh, that you oversee? The foundation came into being in 1923. We are private and nonprofit. We have no governmental ties. We're not in the budget of the city or the county, the state, or the federal government. And that's a surprise to a lot of people who come to the mountaintop. But the mission now is preservation and education to save and to share. And essentially, we are stewardship. Monticello is the only home in America on the world heritage list. And that's a great distinction Monticello shares with the Great Wall of China and the pyramids of Egypt. Well, that's amazing. I didn't know that. The only home. The only home on in the, America on the World Heritage List. Wow. Uh, the Statue of Liberty is on the list, uh, the Grand Canyon, Yosemite National Park. But the only home in America on the World Heritage List is the home of Thomas Jefferson. Well, let's talk about the past, the present, and the future of Monticello, and you, you open a perfect door there. Let's talk about this home. Let's talk about Jefferson. When did he get? When did he get the idea that he said, "You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna build a home up here one day." We tend to forget this, but uh, Thomas Jefferson's father, uh, Peter, was a pioneer. Uh, that the area that we love so much today was wilderness. It was in the back country. He carved out an estate at Shadwell. Uh, when Thomas Jefferson was only 14, his father died. Uh, there were very few other English uh, settlers. The Indians had long since left. But Jefferson could see from Shadwell this uh, little mountain and played there and resolved to build a home. And indeed, he did. And it's the first great home in Virginia on a mountaintop. If we know our colonial history, we are aware that the great estates are all along the rivers and for good reason. Right. Mount Vernon certainly comes to mind up on Mount the bluff Vernon, there. Mount Vernon on the Potomac. Uh, there are great homes on the James. But not a mountain. Uh, that's it. Jefferson uh, took a radical step from the very beginning and setting his sights very high, uh, as indeed his vision was uh, equally elevated. My guest is Dan Jordan, the president of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. And the phone lines are open at 977-1070. Dan, what is it you, th- you think that most people aren't aware of or don't know uh, about Monticello? I think there are a couple of things, uh, Coy. Uh, first, most people are not aware that we're private and nonprofit. They think we're connected to the National Trust or the National Park Service. We're run by the government, but we're completely on their own. We could not be more private sector. 
Uh, then most people are not aware that Monticello is the only home on the World Heritage List, and that's such an enormous uh, uh, compliment to Thomas uh, Jefferson. I think the third thing is they're not aware that we have educational programs all over the world, and we have a separate 78-acre campus across the road. And there are folks in Charlottesville who, in fact, are not aware of our International Center for Jefferson Studies and its amazing outreach globally. Wow. When I think of Monticello, I, I always remember that first sketch that Jefferson drew, uh, likely by, by lamplight, firelight, or, you know, uh, the, and it's, it's sort of the, the very first sketch. There's not a straight line on it. It's just all wavy lines. You clearly see a, a, an architectural novice at best, but a guy who really had this passion. This was something he really wanted to do. But he didn't know the first thing about you know, how am I going to design this? Well, it'd be cool to put a room here and a room there, and we could put a porch there. He truly got a kick out of out of those, uh, sitting down and doing those drawings. He was fascinated at an early age uh, by architecture, and when he was a student at the College of Women Mary, he bought his first book, and he became infatuated with Palladio and um, the, the books of uh, Palladio. Uh, the sketch to which you refer is at Alderman Library, and it's really amazing. And Jefferson's initial vision was quite radical because it had classical features. And this is at a time when other styles uh, dominated. But Jefferson went back hundreds of years for his models. Uh, he constructed a home along those lines uh, on a mountaintop, again with a radical design. He went to France for five years. Uh, he was inspired uh, in other ways about classical architecture, came back, uh, tore down part of what was built from that sketch to which you referred, and greatly expanded and changed the look of Monticello. He added a dome, for example. Uh, he was never completely satisfied. It was said that he took great pleasure in putting up and pulling down. Uh, even at an advanced age, he was still uh, calculating how he could make changes to his mountaintop home. So it's an essay uh, in architecture that was never completed. Yeah, a living document, really, yeah. in, in brick and stone and wood. Dan Jordan, the president of Thomas Jefferson Foundation, is my guest. What is it you think, if he had lived and had the resources, what do you think he would have done with Monticello? Certainly he would have built the tower on Mount Alto, which we can talk about, but what would he have done with with his home? Coy, we don't like to speculate. Uh, we get all kinds of <laughs> questions. Uh, what's Jefferson's position on abortion? What did he think about the war in Iraq? And, and so forth. Uh, we know that he uh, was always rethinking uh, Monticello. Uh, we know that he had some amazing designs that were never implemented. And one that you just mentioned, uh, he acquired Mont Alto, or the high ground overlooking Monticello, uh, in the 1770s, and he did sketch out some possible uh, towers for it. And we have recreated in the form of a model uh, some of Jefferson's ideas in our current business center on Route 20, and they're fascinating. Uh, he also thought about having water cascading down on the Monticello side from the higher ground of Mont Alto. So we can go into Jefferson's sketchbook and, and get all kinds of ideas uh, that if he had the resources and the time, he might have implemented. Right, right. Mount Alto, of course, locals might know as Browns Mountain, but uh, since the Thomas Jefferson Foundation has acquired that, it's my understanding that you have now referred to it, and we should all recognize that it's now referred to as uh, Mount Alto, as Jefferson intended it. Uh, exactly right, and and most locals do know it as Browns Mountain, and uh, lots of law students and graduate students and medical students uh, perhaps even lived up there as Browns Mountain, and, and we know the soul descendant of the Brown family. She's fabulous, and she's been very supportive of our vision for the property. Uh, but if you look at the records over time, it was Carter's Mountain, it was Patterson's Mountain. It's had many names. Right, right. But when we acquired it in the spring of 2004, we wanted to bring it back as much as we could to the Jeffersonian context, and Jefferson's name for it was Mont Alto. It's, a high, it's the higher mountain overlooking the little mountain. Right, Alto from the Latin was for higher, highest, yeah. Um, if, if building and tearing down and creating uh, with, uh, in, with Monticello and the designs brought him such pleasure, what is it, Dan, that disappointed Jefferson the most about Monticello? It's hard to say in any particular way about Monticello uh, itself because it was ever-evolving, and I don't think Jefferson ever had an end game. 
But I think in terms of his life, uh, he would have been very disappointed uh, that the, uh, the progress toward public education was so slow. In the 1770s, he laid out an incredible plan, and the premise was if you're going to have a democracy, the people had better be educated. And the plan included public education, elementary level on up, uh, all the way through to a great public university. And only the latter, which Jefferson called the hobby of my old age, UVA, uh, was uh, completed. Uh, Jefferson was 100 years ahead of his time in terms of public education in Virginia. Virginia. Uh, also, I think uh, he must have been very disappointed at the, the slow pace of the abolition of, of slavery. Uh, there's a great conflict here, a great contradiction, a great paradox. Uh, Jefferson, of course, owned slaves, was dependent upon slave labor, uh, but he wrote uh, the most eloquent prose imaginable uh, condemning it. Uh, so one has to believe that um, that was a disappointment. Dan Jordan is president of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation and our guest this hour on Charlottesville right now. (coughs) Excuse me. The phone lines are open at 977-1070. We're talking about the past, the present, and the future of Monticello. As far as the past is concerned, Jefferson, of course, died uh, June, July 4th of 1826, just about a year after the University of Virginia opened. What happened to Monticello after that, after his death? uh, Jefferson, sadly, was... Uh, heavily in debt. Um, Someone said, and this is a a somber thought, that had he died 10 years earlier, uh, the debt question would be moot. But there was a national depression. Jefferson had loaned money. Uh, Debt uh, went bad in some cases. Uh, Some of his mills were not as profitable as he thought. And in his final decade, uh, he could see clearly that he was not going to be able to leave Monticello so the family could keep it. Indeed, when he died, uh, they began to sell off some of the slaves, some of the land, and ultimately the property uh, changed hands. And and a local bought it for a while. Uh, But in the 1830s, uh, an admirer of Jefferson, who was a Jewish naval officer by the name of Uriah Phillips Levy, and we cherish his memory, uh, purchased it because he felt, and this is a great quote, uh, uh, great homes uh, of great men should be preserved as monuments to their memory. And that's good preservation doctrine. The Levy family actually had Monticello with the exception of the break in the Civil War era and shortly afterwards, uh, longer than Jefferson. And they were good stewards, and uh, we would not be uh, able to share the Jefferson ideals through the House uh, the way we can now without the levy stewardship. So we have had conferences about the levies. We have an exhibit about the levies. We've commissioned a book on the levies, and we honor their memory. Dan, tell us about Uriah Levy, because I know next to nothing about this guy, and we really have Monticello today because he stepped in and and saved it, because there's no telling what would have happened to it if it wasn't owned by a man who recognized that this is something that needs to be saved for our great-grandchildren's grandchildren. Uriah uh, Phillips Levy uh, was an extraordinary individual. Uh, Ultimately, he was the first Jewish flag officer uh, in the U.S. Navy. He also was the man responsible for the abolition of flogging as a punishment in the U.S. Navy. He was a fiery individual. He was court-martialed on a number of occasions, but he beat the rap in every instance, and rightly so. He died in 1862. He had uh, no direct heirs. And he left Monticello in essence, and it's very complicated, but I'm going to just summarize it for you, to the people of America through the Congress of the United States. And, of course, in 1862, Virginia had seceded from the Union, so Monticello became contested property for a while. It was put up at auction as alien property owned by, you know, a federal naval officer when the Confederacy was in play. And it was actually purchased by a graduate of VMI uh, for a while. All roads lead to VMI uh, sooner or later. (laughs) Um, And then the Levy family consolidated claims uh, in the 1870s and had it until 1923. And the the final owner uh, was an amazing man, a congressman, a businessman, a very successful uh, real estate broker in New York. Um, And he had an amazing name, which was Jefferson Monroe Levy. There you go. <laughs> but they're, they're, without their stewardship, we would, would not be here today. Tell us about the Thomas Jefferson Foundation and how Jefferson's home went from the, the Levy family to this uh, private organization which continues to operate it today. As time passed, uh, Jefferson Monroe Levy found it more and more difficult to keep up uh, the property. And at the same time, there were several groups who felt it should be owned in a way that it would be open to the public systematically. Uh, the levies had always made it available on a kind of ad hoc basis. Uh, in 1923, two of these groups coalesced in New York City, of all places, and they uh, included a number of prominent politicians. It included Felix Warburg. 
Goldberg, who was one of the great financiers of that era. And they negotiated a deal uh, with Mr. Levy, and the property was acquired. But from the very beginning, it was private and nonprofit. Uh, they had to pay off the mortgage. Uh, school kids in Chicago and New York City and elsewhere uh, sent pennies. Uh, they had a Jefferson train. You could uh, buy a ticket for X amount that was a contribution to Monticello. Uh, they were very ingenious in their fundraising. Uh, finally, the mortgage is paid off about 1940, and that uh, was the end of fundraising until just recently. And th- throughout this process in the 20th century, it- it's been one of sort of an unfolding narrative of how to remember Thomas Jefferson and how to remember Monticello. Uh, it-, it sort of has changed uh, through the years. That's absolutely right. Uh, I think the foundation has always had strong leadership on the staff and on its board, but the focus uh, began to evolve uh, in recent years more toward a joint mission, not just preservation, which is fundamental. Uh, Monticello is the great iconic uh, artifact that we have to protect at all costs, uh, but toward the notion of outreach and education and scholarship. Uh, Our International Center for Jefferson Studies uh, that bears the name of Robert H. Smith, who's our great benefactor, Uh, has, uh, for example, uh, 15 PhDs on the staff. Uh, We have programming all over the world. Uh, We've had 220 scholars in residence, like a college campus. It's 78 beautiful acres across from Monticello. And this is at Kenwood, right? It's at Kenwood, which is a historic estate associated with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And Roosevelt used it as kind of a Camp David uh, during uh, World War II. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. It's a beautiful place, and uh, Roosevelt was there on the eve of the Normandy invasion. It was delayed. He went back to Washington, but it was a place he could escape. Right, right. We're talking with Dan Jordan, the president of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, about the past, the present, and the future of Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. You're listening to Charlottesville Right Now on the Charlottesville Podcasting Network at com. If you're enjoying hearing about Monticello, check out our podcasts from Monticello. Search for Monticello at com. And now back to Coy Barefoot with Thomas Jefferson Foundation President Jan Jordan. Let's rejoin the conversation with Dan Jordan, the president of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. We've been talking about the past of Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. Let's talk about the present and the, the scope. You've sort of hinted at some of the work that you all do. The, the scope of this uh, really amazing organization. I bet folks have no idea how many people <laughs> work for you over there. It's into the hundreds, is it not? We have about 360 individuals on the payroll, and uh, as a matter of policy, we don't have uh, very many volunteers. We're making an occasional exception, but I think we might have one or two at the moment. Of the 360, about 125 or 30 are full-time year-round, so it's a much bigger operation than most people in the community uh, might guess. And as you were talking about the the research, the phenomenal research that goes on at Kenwood, which is really a, a little university there, uh, it it's goes so far beyond just what most folks think of as tours of a home. Absolutely right. Uh, the mission of the foundation, which is private and nonprofit, is preservation and education to save and uh, to share. And we believe the mission is best advanced through serious academic scholarship. We have 15 PhDs on the Monticello staff. And the core of most of our research is at the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies across the road, 78 acres with buildings constructed around a historic home, which was Kenwood. Yeah. Tell us, how many people tour Monticello in a year? I remember reading years ago, it was, what, five or 600,000? We had about 450,000 last year. Uh, we had hoped that we would get a bounce from the Jamestown celebration and might go up to 470. Uh, We are essentially flat, and uh, we hope to add a bit between now and December. But we're looking at 450 to 460 for uh, 2007. Did it dip after 9-11 nationwide, uh, tourism like that? Uh, Nationwide, tourism uh, took a hit uh, after 9-11, and that's quite understandable. Uh, But at many sites across the country, visitation was already beginning to ebb a bit. Uh, I'll give you one amazing number. Uh, Just a few years ago, the National Park Service and all of its sites had roughly... 70 million visitors. Uh, Last year, they only had 60 million. 
So the National Park Service itself lost about 10 million visitors. Wow. I have this theory that as we see the baby boomers age and retire and and leave the workforce, that we're going to see more tourism as a result. Is that far-fetched? Is that accurate? Have you seen those kind of predictions by folks who are a lot smarter than me? Uh, Coy, I hope you're right. Um, (laughs) The historic sites uh, throughout the country uh, are are betting on uh, some kind of a renaissance. Uh, We believe that our nation's heritage is fundamental. We think it's especially important that young people understand uh, who we are and where we've come from. Uh, All of us are working very hard uh, to encourage people to come and enjoy and appreciate uh, what every survey uh, tells us is the most accessible form of our history. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, many surveys suggest that textbook history is dead. Uh, Many surveys tell us that classroom history is is, um, at risk uh, for lots of reasons. Uh, But all the surveys suggest that people who come to the historic sites uh, have a three-dimensional experience, and at least it creates an interest. Yeah. Now, we have you have a lot of cooperation uh, from local and regional school groups, I would imagine. They plug into your resources pretty well. We have an amazing education uh, department. Uh, We uh, serve classes from all over the United States. Uh, We have prepared uh, material. Uh, We have also extraordinary resources on the Internet for teachers and for students. Uh, We have a number of specialized programs. Uh, We'll send one of our instructors into every elementary school in the city of Richmond in a two-year cycle. Uh, Some of the outlying counties uh, in the Tidewater area, uh, we have special programs whereby uh, we provide the funds for school buses to bring their kids that otherwise would not be able to afford it uh, to come to Monticello. So we've been very aggressive, very creative. We work with the schools uh, because we think that planting a seed in a young mind uh, is an investment in the future of our country. My guest is Dan Jordan, the president of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. And the phone line is open at 977-1070 if you've got a comment or a question about Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. You mentioned the Internet, Dan. Tell folks about your information technology program, which I know y'all were way out ahead of most folks when it, when it came to the Internet. Uh, I'm very proud of the work we've done in information technology, uh, even though I myself uh, don't even have a computer. Uh, but in the 1990s, we kept hearing about, you know, this web thing. And uh, so I had a brilliant assistant, and she had gone to Rice and uh, graduated with the highest honors, was very creative, grew up with computers. We said disappear for six months and come back with a website that we can be very proud of. It's not advertising, not spend, but just good, solid content that would be accessible. So Monticello was, I believe, the third historic organization in America, maybe the world, to have a website. And we got up on wow. President's Day in 1996, and it's grown by leaps and bounds. Uh, the outreach is amazing. We keep adding to it. Fortunately, we have trustees who believe in information technology who've supported uh, these initiatives. And we've also won every award, including including uh, one that's kind of uh, uh, funny, uh, as you say, the name, but it's the equivalent of the Academy Award or the Oscar in the field, and it's called a Webby. Yeah, um, yeah, heard of that. We were contacted by the organization that presents the award, and they said, congratulations in the category of cultural institutions. Uh, Monticello has been nominated for a Webby. And I said, well, gee, that's great. And, and what's the competition? They said the Library of Congress and the British Museum. So it was a great <laughs> honor to be nominated. Uh, but then we got another call and said, congratulations uh, further. Uh, you are the winner, and you need to send someone to New York. And gave us a date and said that there would be a red carpet, black tie, very glitzy event uh, where Monticello would be presented to Webby. We thought that was fabulous. Of course, we're going to send the webmaster, Chad Woolerton. He was told uh, along the way uh, that they had learned from the difficulties of the Tonys, the Emmys, the Academy Awards, or people standing up and making political speeches or thanking their dog or going on and on. And so their guidelines, since they started from scratch, uh, were very different, and that is that Chad would be limited to five words in his acceptance speech. <laughs> if, he, if he were nervous and said, hi, Mom and Dad, that's four words, he's got one left. So Chad, who's very clever, uh, gets up there and – uh, just as they do with the Academy Awards, they show pictures of the finalists and, and try to explain why they're all worthy. And then they announce, in this case, uh, in the category of cultural institutions, the winner is the Thomas Jefferson Foundation Monticello and accepting is Chad Woolton, the webmaster. Chad gets up and he says, all websites aren't created equal. 
and everybody laughed and applauded and uh, and that that he he made a statement and 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 five words but we we're doing so many amazing things uh, last year people from all the world read between 6 and 7 million pages off our website Gosh. Uh, we have a virtual tour now. If you want to see what's behind the walls, if you want to go upstairs, uh, you can do just incredible things on the virtual tour. Uh, we've just rolled out a Thomas Jefferson wiki. Uh, and the difference between <laughs> our wiki and, and the one that's so famous is that we uh, carefully vet the content. We work with scholars. I think we've got several hundred entries up now. And this time next year, we'll have about 1,500 entries up. So anything having to do with Jefferson that you're curious about, you can get accurate information. Uh, we also received last year about 5,000 queries at our Jefferson Library. Uh, and it may be from the New York Times checking a quote. It may be from an author who wants some background information and uh, so forth. And these aren't school kids because our education department feels those. Um, so I, we'd, we'd like to believe that the International Center is a source of reliable information, and the, and the information technology program has greatly enhanced it. We're talking with Dan Jordan, the president of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, about the past, the present, and the future of Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. You also have some, uh, I know this because I married an archaeologist, yeah. you have some amazing archaeology that goes on up there year round and and Fraser Nyman of course one of the very best historical archaeologists in the world Uh, you have him uh, up there at Monticello as well a very strong department within the International Center for Jefferson Studies and we do conferences all over the world we publish books we have teachers we hadn't talked about that 90 teachers every summer from all the United States come in but a very strong department is archaeology and Fraser is incredible and I think we have the best historical archaeology program in America and it's heavily based on information uh, technology uh, Frazier created uh, something called the Digital Archaeological Archives of Chesapeake Slavery. It's now been expanded to comparative slavery. Uh, we have archaeologists from Monticello in Jamaica. And you might say, what's the connection? Well, it's pretty simple, and you can't understand what's going on at Monticello as we unearth these artifacts unless you put it in context, and the context is plantation slavery. Uh, this is a collaboration. Uh, there are over 20 other sites, Mount Vernon, Colonial Williamsburg, sites in North Carolina, Maryland, and in Jamaica uh, that uh, are working with us. But there's a database now of amazing information about plantation slavery, uh, thanks to Frazier's initiative. And it's accessible, my understanding, it's accessible online to researchers who yeah. want to go in and, and do their own research. Exactly it's all right. provided uh, there for them. Again, it's a, it's a collaboration, but uh, for example, the Mount Vernon collection, uh, the Colonial Williamsburg collection, our collection, many, uh, I think there are over almost two dozen now. Uh, a protocol had to be developed on how to define a nail and so forth. Right, right. But everything was inventoried, everything was uh, categorized, and everything's put online. So anybody anywhere in the world, students, teachers, scholars, just uh, interested general public, will have access to that information. Dan Jordan is president of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. One thing I know a lot of folks want to know about here uh, is the new visitor center for Monticello. Tell us what's going on, because it, I understand that you have broken ground. Where is it? What is it? What's the timetable? And sort of paint a picture for us of what this is going to look like. Coy, as a politician, says, uh, thanks for asking that question. <laughs> uh, the visitor center is indeed uh, out of the ground. I was on site this afternoon. Uh, there are many of the steel frames that are in place. It's most impressive. It's where the current shuttle station is now. And it's going to be an absolutely superior facility that will improve our visitor amenities, provide an opportunity to learn on arrival, will be a gateway to Monticello, not a competitive attraction. Uh, and it um, is going to be landscaped beautifully, and we're uh, going for the LEED certification, which is the highest you can get in sustainable sure, yeah, design. Yeah. And um, we were talking about earlier uh, off the air about some of the things that will be part of the visitor center. Right. When you walk through the door, tell us what what the experience will be like. Well, first of all, it's, it's lies lightly on the land. It's going to be very leafy, very open. It's a village around a courtyard. So there's a ticket pavilion, so you're protected from the weather. Uh, there is a theater with an orientation film, which we haven't had. There's a wonderful cafe that's kind of leave it out into the trees so you can get a good meal. Uh, there's a wonderful exhibition building that has two stories uh, to it, and our curator, Susan Stein, is working on four different exhibits, one changing and the other three permanent, large retail space. Um, it's going to be just amazing, and I think it's going to uh, enhance the visitor's experience dramatically, but it's an entranceway. 
We also have added time tickets and reservations, so there's no waiting. Uh, you can do the, get a ticket uh, online in advance, or you show up, and you're given a time, so you don't wait around. When you get on that shuttle bus, you go straight to the house, and you go straight into the house. So we're eliminating waiting. Oh, wow. You're kidding. So oh. no more uh, sitting on that little wall in the sunshine outside uh, of Monticello. That's right. Uh, unless you want to sit around and have something to eat yeah, uh, yeah. and just enjoy a beautiful setting at the Vista Center. It's also connected to the Sondas uh, Monticello Trail. Uh, that's part of our... Thomas Jefferson Parkway. We had 85,000 people use that trail last year. Uh, this is all funded by the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. It has no connection whatsoever with the city or the county. It's and that's most, beautiful. That turned out so nice. It's a beautiful uh, parkway. Yeah. Uh, Will Riley was the architect. Peter Hatch was a visionary on our staff. And um, we're very proud to have that as a bridge to the community. That's gotten very popular, too. Have you seen all the cars out there when people drive over <laughs> to a park just to walk that trail? Well, Coy, I'm happy to announce that by the end of the year, we'll have an overflow parking lot. that We've already built the tunnel under 53, so there'll be lots of space for people to park. But we love our parkway users. Uh, they are very proprietary. Uh, we get love letters from them. Uh, people tell us it's been a godsend for their health program. Uh, folks all ages use it. We, on a typical day, uh, will have uh, you know hundreds of people at, at any time who are enjoying uh, the out-of-doors and that beautifully landscaped and, and planned trail that goes from the bottom, Route 20, all the way to Monticello. And it will connect to the new Vista Center. Oh, yeah. Okay. So it'll go right to it. Yes. That's wonderful. So you could park down at the bottom of the, the, the hill there and walk up and eventually get up into the house. Exactly right. And we keep uh, adding side trails and spur trails. So... Uh, ultimately, there'll be many options for folks and not just the basic trail. We're talking with Dan Jordan, the president of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. And the website, folks, of course, if you want to explore more online, is Monticello.org. That was one advantage of getting up early, by the way. It's a very simple domain name. Right, right. Dan, what's the, what are the plans for uh, Mont Alto, what, Browns Mountain, Carter's Mountain, next to Monticello? What are you all going to be uh, doing up there? It's hard to imagine a more conspicuous landscape feature in central Virginia than what the locals have long known as Browns Mountain, but we've decided to call Mont Alto, taking it back to Jeffersonian times. It came on the market very suddenly. Uh, there were developers who wanted to buy it because there were 27 house lots by right. If we hadn't acted uh, on the West Lawn, we'd be looking at 27 Mac Mansions. But fortunately, uh, people rallied. Um, the person who was brokering the sale said it was a set amount of $15 million, uh, which was exactly what Jefferson paid for the Louisiana uh, purchase. <laughs> and we were able to get uh, a loan because we didn't have the money. And our first goal was to pay off the debt, and we have done that. Now we can concentrate on three visionary goals. And one <clears throat> is to extend the trails from down below all the way to the top, which will be very exciting. Another is to return the landscape as best we can to the way Jefferson would have known it. And the third is to convert the old farmhouse that, that the Browns lived in for so long into an education center. And I, I could not be more excited about thinking about school kids running around in the summer and learning history, geography, and the like, or executive education programs. It's going to be amazing. Right, right. And th th this is, you've, you've opened the door here for the future of my Monticello, if the, that mountain has always been a place for vision. It's always been a place to look to the future, whether it was next week or, you know, 50 years. What is your vision, your personal vision, when you sit back at the end of the day and you think about the future of the foundation, the future of, of Monticello? Tell Boy, us about that. Uh, we've been very fortunate in having some amazing people on the board, and I have wonderful colleagues, and we're just fanatical about planning. So we actually, and don't laugh, but we have a 10-year plan and a 25-year plan. So I can tell you what the goals are for Monticello in the year 2023. And they're very exciting. Uh, and they're nine. And one is that we want to develop Shadwell, for example. And maybe it would be passive interpretation like trails and signs and the like. But we own Jefferson's birthplace. Oh, that would be and great. And certainly we want to do something there. Yeah, that'd be great. Most so, people don't even know it's there. I mean, you, there's the sign. The, that's right. The highway marker. but uh, It's on 20, uh, 250 East. And right. uh, it's a great piece of property, but we want to be good stewards of it. And part of that would be, and this is another goal, is restoring Jefferson's mill, which was on the Ravana River. And establishing a trail network. Wow. So we have a plan for Monticello in the year 2023. Dan Jordan is president of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, and you can explore more online at Monticello.org. Dan, this has been a true thrill for me and a sincere honor, and I appreciate you coming in. Coy, thank you very much. This interview will be archived in its entirety on the Charlottesville Podcasting Network at SeavillePodcast.com. You've been listening to WINA's Charlottesville Right Now with Coy Barefoot. 
Charlottesville Right Now is broadcast live Monday through Friday on News Radio 1070 WINA from 4 to 6 p.m. Best selling author and historian Coy Barefoot is the host and producer. To participate in the program, you can call 434 977 1070. Coy can be reached at barefoot at wina.com. This is the Charlottesville Podcasting Network, Seville Podcast.com.